Uh, my name is Catherine Colbert. I'm the uh, director of the Athena Center for Leadership Studies. And let me just say it's been a pleasure to participate uh, in this conference and to uh, see so many of you here to join us. Um, and I look forward to an extraordinary panel uh, because uh, I had the opportunity at lunch to talk with some of the panelists who are just incredibly fascinating and um, people who give me uh, inspiration for uh, what I hope will be an ongoing discussion of feminism over the next several generations. Uh, and we, uh, let me just say, as, as probably the oldest member of this crowd, it's very nice to see uh, discussions that uh, began with you know, my sisters many years older being passed down and thought through and thought about in different ways uh, and have the influence of extraordinary cultures and different uh, technologies that change the discussion and enrich it for all of us. Um, let me do some introductions and then turn it over uh, to Jimmy Briggs, who's going to moderate the panel. <laughs> I don't think Lena Bowie needs any introduction already. Uh, <laughs> but I just wanted to say one thing, which is one of the great parts about having Lima at Barner is how she inspires our students. Um, and I do want to just thank you publicly for that. Uh, your voice has, uh, I, I've watched it in the classroom as students listen to Lima and go, oh, I have the power and the potential to change the world. She did it, I can do it too. And that's an extraordinary gift, and I thank you. So here we have uh, Hakima Abbas, who is um, a political scientist, policy analyst, activist. Uh, she's been active in struggles for social justice on issues of self-determination, race, class, gender, sexuality, uh, for over 15 years. Uh, her professional work as a trainer, strategist, and researcher has focused on strengthening and supporting movements for change in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, and she is currently the director of programs at the Association for Women's Rights and Development, an international feminist membership organization. An editor and author of various publications, Akima is also a member of the editorial collective of the Feminist Choir and a contributor to Al Jazeera Online. And she serves as a board member of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, Eastern Africa Office, and the African Sex Worker Alliance and Greenpeace Africa. Uh, a very busy person. So thank you, Akima, for joining us. Uh, next to her is Spectra, uh, who's an award-winning Nigerian writer, gender justice advocate and new media evangelist at uh, Spectra Speaks, uh, which is online at spectraspeaks.com, a little plug there for your blog, uh, which is a uh, global Afro-feminist blog which publishes uh, social commentary about gender, sexuality, diaspora communities, and movement building through the lens of love and media psychology. She is also the founder and executive editor at Queer Women of Color Media Wire, a media advocacy organization that amplifies the voices of LGBTI racial and ethnic minorities around the world, uh, and the community engagement officer at Africans in the Diaspora, a philanthropic organization that nurtures principal philanthropy in Africa. So we have two extraordinarily busy women. Uh, Spectra is also the principal at a boutique consulting firm uh, which offers coaching and support services to women-led ventures in new media for branding, creative campaigning, thought leadership, and social impact. Uh, her work using media to amplify the voices of marginalized people has earned her international recognition uh, on such media outlets as ABC, Huffington Post, Ms. Magazine, on and on. Incredible uh, placements, and in her spare time, she curates live art and music events Hosts the monthly podcast Kitchen Table Conversations, I'm sorry, Kitchen Table Conversations, uh, and supports Indian mainstream films, books, music projects by women and queer artists. So I want to welcome uh, Spectra here. We also have with us Jimmy Briggs, uh, who, uh, among other things, uh, is a uh, fellow with the Athena Center this past year uh, and has been contributing uh, his uh, thinking about feminism uh, with our students. Uh, so it's been great to have you, uh, Jimmy, in that. 
Uh, over the past two decades, he's earned a reputation as a respected human rights advocate in the field of journalism and as a lecturer and educator. Uh, through extensive travels in countries of Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, he's produced seminal writings and reporting on the lives of war affected youth and ch child soldiers, as well as survivors of sexual violence. His book on child so soldiers uh, and war affected children, called Innocence Lost When Child Soldiers Go to War, won him accolades in 2005 and took readers into the personal journeys of war affected youth. Uh, Jimmy has served as an adjunct professor of investigative journalism at the New School for Social Research and was a George A. Miller visiting professor in the Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Illinois at Champlain. His upcoming book, Blood Work, narratively examines personal transformation and manhood through his own life and that of several recognizable figures from around the world. Uh, for most of you probably know Jimmy in connection with his work on man and the Man Up campaign uh, and the issue of violence against women. Uh, he was a, selected as the winner of the 2012 GQ magazine Better, man, uh, Better Men, Better World search as women's e-news 21 leaders for the 21st century. And um, this past year uh, with LEMA uh, got the Medal of Distinction at Barnum's graduation. So we're thrilled to have Jimmy with us. Uh, next to Jimmy, Fidele <laughs> Dosikan, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, who is a research, uh, has a research master's degree in gender studies from the University of Cape Town, where she was the J.W. Jagger <laughs> postgraduate scholar and researched the fear of rape among women who had not yet experienced it. She is currently a PhD student at King's College London, researching new styles of femininity among young uh, Lagosian women and analyzing representations of this style on a popular, popular Nigerian website. Uh, she is interested in understanding the kinds of feminine identities or senses of self that accompany the prevalent hyper-feminized mode of appearance and self-presentation uh, among young women in this demographic. Her bachelor's degree is in social studies from Harvard University, where she was a Mellon mentored undergraduate fellow. Uh, she comes from Lagos, Nigeria, where she spent three years managing an independent publishing house under whose imprint she offered a children's educational book and co-authored two primary school textbooks. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jimmy to start the panel and uh, let's give them our panel a one more. First and foremost, Kate, thank you for that introduction for myself and for all of us. Um, like my, my counterpart before, Sister Lucia, I feel very overwhelmed being up on stage with these four very powerful women, uh, two of whom I know well, two others who I look forward to getting in this conversation in future months. Um, there's a particular burden being the last panel today after lunch. Um, Lingma said to me before we started, uh, we just had lunch, we have to make this provocative. Yeah. So that, that's, that's the charge I have is to help make this conversation provocative and it will be more of a conversation. Um, first, I think it's important in, in talking with, with, with all three ladies over lunchtime is really to, to, to frame the picture what we're talking about, um, not just with this, the multi generational aspect of, of uh, the activism of African women, but, but what does it look like? What are the, the spaces? Um, how the story is told. So uh, first I'll ask a question of Simi, if I may, that you're next to me. Um, from your experience, Simi, where, where are the spaces that you find um, opportunities for multi-generational exchange and collaboration um, in the African women's activist space? Thank you very much um, for that question. I think, I think it's, I mean, it's a good question and I think, um, I would say, start by saying that I don't feel that, that there are that many spaces, actually. And so hopefully that's one of the things that will come out of the conversation today, is how do we create more spaces and what kinds of spaces and who gets to access them. Um, in my experience, limited experience, I would say that there are probably two primary spaces where I've had the opportunity to engage with African feminists across generational lines and across other lines. Um, one of which is the, well, two related spaces, the Nigerian Feminist Forum and the African Feminist Forum. 
Um, so both of those spaces are, as the names imply, they're spaces where um, self-identified feminists come together. They're also virtual spaces, actually. So for instance, in the Nigerian Feminist Forum, has, is also a list of, so you know, it's an email exchange that happens. So everybody's not necessarily physically always in the same place or even in Nigeria. Um, and so in those spaces, I think young women are present to some extent. And, you know, it's, it, they're forums where um, there's exchange and there's dialogue and there's play, there's also fun, laughter and dancing and things like that. Um, but I think they're quite constructive spaces for for exchange. Um, and then secondly, again, in my experience, is in the academic spaces. And I mean, I suppose in my case, it's because I happen to have been in, in some of those spaces. Um, so for instance, I did my master's degree at the African Gender Institute um, at the University of Cape Town. So obviously there, as a young African um, feminist scholar in training, or hoping to be, um, you know, it was a place where I could sort of engage with more established African feminist thinkers whose work I had been reading and I had been sort of following, and then I could actually sort of meet them and interact with them. But, but I mean, needless to say, I think both of those kinds of spaces are very privileged. Um, so there is also still need to kind of talk about other spaces that are less kind of structurally um, defined or demarcated. Thank you, Simi. Um, Spectra, could you, could you weigh on a question as well? We'll have a lunch on the it's interesting thoughts around the spaces that this opportunity for exchange has happened. And, and Simi mentioned the academic space, which she talked about a bunch as well. So I, I um, just, just to, to preface where I'm, I will be speaking from, I, I speak mainly from a personal place because that's what I know and I, I feel I have most authority to speak from my, my experience. Um, I came to understand um, what I've now termed African feminism through my mother. Um, my mom was a philanthropist, really lack of a better word. She organized charities, she was constantly um, doing food drives, she founded the first women's trust fund in Nigeria, she was really, really active. And beyond just sort of the, I guess, formal manifestation of activism, my mom also would bring cousins who make, you know, sometimes not confirmed cousins from um, <laughs> from the villages stay, stay with us in our house to, you know, support them going to school, support young women going to school. Um, we took care of neighbors' kids. We, um, we gave people that didn't have as, as many, she gave away our clothes to families who, you know, she said were less privileged than us. So I got various different forms of, um, or models of activism through my mother. And um, all without ever uttering the F word, all without ever using words like, you know, pedag I still can't say pedagogy, pedag yeah. okay, that. Um, and all without, so all without, you know, um, what I would describe as a, a relatively sophisticated vernacular to talk about just this business of, of doing good in the world. And so when I, you know, when I heard the question about if there are spaces in which you could exchange and meet other African feminists and, 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 and um, engage in sort of intergenerational activism, I thought absolutely yes, because my aunties, my mom, my community, um, my personal life, the mentors in my life have, have been really instrumental in shaping my own thinking and um, affirming my, my, my right and entitlement to call myself an African feminist. So I didn't need sort of um, formal spaces, which I, I, do, you know, I do agree with, with Simi that um, can be limited and can be quite privileged. Um, but I, I see them see them everywhere. Now, with regards to the formal spaces or academia in general, and I think it you know it makes sense to talk about it since we are at Barnard. My first introduction to feminism as a word in general uh, came when I arrived in this, at this, uh, in this country when I was 18, and um, I was in some liberal arts class, and um, a white girl got really excited you know about sharing. Um, sharing information about black feminism. And she was like, oh, you know, because Bell, Hook, Bell Hooks, and she mentioned to me Bell Hooks. And I said, what, who's that? And she like gasped and stood back and was like, oh my God, how could you not know who Bell Hooks is? And it made me feel very angry. And I remember just feeling just like, why on earth am I being judged for not knowing who Bell Hooks is? And she can't name one African feminist leader, one political leader, one leader at all in Africa. But I was, you know, in this country being judged based on some, some standard or some, you know, canon, right, of, of, of sort of knowledge of, the, of a particular kind of thought leadership, 
um, particular kind of scholarship, and you know that really frustrated me. And it sort of minimized my own understanding of what feminism could be, even though it was a word I just learned. From the way people talked about it, um, from what it was supposed to mean, people standing up for gender equality, men, women, everyone in between, um, caring about people with less privilege than you, all of those things which I felt were universal and not necessarily contextualized um, or didn't need to be contextualized by geography. Um, I resented the fact that she um, felt that I, as a black feminist, right, this, that, that's a whole different issue, but as a black feminist that I needed to know um, who Bell Hooks was, who was Audre Lorde was, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I've come to love all those women and they're amazing. Um, but at the time it was really frustrating. And so academia for me, and understanding African feminism through that lens has been actually quite alienating and silencing. Um, and I've resisted against um, engaging with that sort of um, level of, not scholarship, but um, the elitism that I perceived um, in those spaces, um, not only because I think it can alienate um, African feminists who don't know, who, don't, who aren't familiar or who aren't um, comfortable with African feminism through that lens, but also because it can be very silencing towards young people as well. Um, in the academic arena, to start, you know, most people will say, well, um, I'm an African feminist and I studied this, 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 and this, and you start to list out all the degrees, that's a number of years. And so with the, with the extra number of years comes older people. And so you usually find, or I have found, um, when sort of engaging with African feminists from an academic space, they're usually older. Um, and so I think, you know, so to bring it back to the, to the panel and talk about intergenerational activism, it can really sort of silence and marginalize younger, younger people's voices. I'm interested in the way the question is framed, because often when we talk about multi-generational feminist activism, we're talking about the inclusion of young feminists. And yet, African feminism is relevant if it's not for young feminists. And we need to stop thinking about young feminists as the leaders of tomorrow, because actually they're the leaders of today. They are doing the work, they're doing the organizing, they're building in their communities and in our continent. And I say they because also, I think I have to acknowledge that on this panel, this panel is not representative of multi-generations. <laughs> um, I have a teenage daughter. She has language and modes of communication and things that she's talking about that have nothing, I... <laughs> <laughs> over my head entirely. Um, and yet, that's where the thinking is happening, that's where the, again, I don't want to use the future, that's where today's African feminism is happening. And that's what is shaping our continent. And if we're not able to speak those languages and understand that actually we're the ones who need to be included, we're the ones who need to be able to learn and be mentored by these young women who have a whole other discourse, then I think we, we miss a lot. And that's not to say that we don't learn from our histories. And obviously our histories are very important, and particularly our her stories. Um, and I think, you know, I'll also come out as a pan-Africanist, despite the patriarchy that's being talked about today within pan-Africanism. But the histories of our liberation struggles, the histories of, of Africa are certainly imbued in everything that we're doing. But we have to think of our futures as imaginative and something that we can forge forward. We have to stop talking about cultures as static. We have to stop talking about patriarchy as if it is our culture. Um, and we have to understand that resistance actually has been part of our culture forever. And that is included in African feminism. We need to first understand every time we talk about intergenerational activism, my experience in Nairobi a few years ago comes to mind, where you have some older, quote unquote, African feminists, and some not so old like, I was, like myself, and then the very young ones. And we were having a conversation of where we came from to find ourselves to where we are today. And I think, the first thing we need to do in order to engage the way we want to engage is have an understanding of where these women came from. 
what activism meant to them, how they engaged in it. Because what we saw in that room that day was a lot of frustration from the older feminists who felt like we had come, encroached on their space, and we're now trying to push them out. Sooner or later, we will start feeling the same way with people like Spectra and Semi and all of them because there is this feeling that we, we haven't really cultivated, and it's true. First, let me say it the way it was said by this older woman. We got into activism because we were passionate about what our societies were going through. It was not a day's job. It was a volunteer services. We got on it, we worked on it, and you all are enjoying the fruits. But the way you're treating us is like when people get on a mutato, a bus, and they ride it, and it breaks down, and they get on, and then they see a nice car, get on and they're not willing to help fix that bus. That's the first point. So this conversation also extended in Accra. And I don't know if PC remembers, but we had the first policy forum for West African women. And it came up, Gloria Steinem was there. So we had a whole generation again of feminists. And the question of you know, these older women need to retire. Someone stood up and said, I've done this all of my life. Where am I retiring to? So you have the question of the history of the movement, the history of the women in the movement, and the question of what space or spaces are we cultivating for retirement for them? Until we can, especially on our continent, because most of these women are not PhD holders. So they cannot go into the quote unquote academic space to retire into teaching or knowledge sharing. That's one. Two, they've never really taken up time to write their story. So writing is not part of their culture. So where are they going to find themselves? That's the second one. The other trouble we have is, and then I'll stop right here. <laughs> Those of us who wrote the Mutatu at our age, and I'm trying to dress closer to the ages of my big sisters here. We are making the same mistakes. We've never, we're not bringing the young people along. You see a movement of young, it was so refreshing to be in Uganda at AFF and see a whole different dimension, AFF is the African Feminist Forum of young people in that room, and what the distinction were there. So you have these young women who are embracing LGBT issues, and you have the older women who are still on the far right, not wanting to say anything, and you have a gay couple get on the dance floor and they're dancing and doing that thing, and those old ladies, especially for those of us who find ourselves in the habit of carrying their handbags when we're up, Tapping you and saying it's time to go to bed. These children are about to do nasty things here. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you, because you're in the middle, it's, I, I don't want to go to bed. So are you part of this thing? Please, let's go to bed. I don't want to see this. You want to say what? So, I, I think the way the intergenerational thing can happen is two ways. Young people, we need to create the space to talk about the current issue and create the space so that they talk about their issues and how we provide that platform for everybody to be heard and embrace the other. But until we can do that, some of the stiffest resistance we'll find to the emerging issue of young African feminists will be the older feminists in the movement. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Tim. I, you, know, you raised some critical points, a lot of you did like today. I just want to continue what you just said. Um, two things. One, do you think that um, how, how her stories are passed on is one point of dependent to the sensitivity or respect of the new generation? Because, you know, you said yourself, the new generation didn't write down their experiences, they didn't, you know, they didn't document 
the lessons learned from this social action or this uprising of this, um, you know, this local movement. Uh, it, was, it was carried primarily poorly for a long time. Um, another thing, too, that I was thinking of this um, when, when he was talking, when you were talking, you know, as an African American, I'm very fascinated by the civil rights movement in the 60s and 50s and beyond. And one of the things, it, it, as you were talking, all of you were talking, just came to mind. It, it felt very familiar in this sense of the older generation, the older generation of activists um, pushing forward, often without support, formal academic training, resources. Um, but then, you know, as the younger generation comes up, there's no path, there's no formal passing of the time. There's no mentorship of this older person, this older activist saying, the younger person, this is what we did, this is, you know, this is what we learned, and actually preparing the next generation to, to assume leadership in a, a formal, respectful way. Um, and I just want to put that out, put those two questions out there for the panel as a whole. Quickly, let's be honest, when I got into the Marines movement, I was moving in the dark, you know, really trying to find what was available, what was there for me, who's going to help me. Because my socialization had been, when you talk about each other, they do this, they do that, it took an older feminist to sit me down to show the way. Most of the time, the way the stories, first, we don't have a lot of spaces where people are able to talk about their experiences as older feminists. So that passing down of the history of feminism in Africa, you don't have a lot of that happening in my context. That's the first thing. The second thing you have, and I mentioned it earlier, when you talk about handing down the baton, there are many older feminists who are very resistant to it. Because the question of where do I go next? This is my life, this is all I've done. And I don't have anywhere to retire to. That's the second question. But I think as coming back to the whole issue of intergenerational discourse and what we do, there are a lot of assumptions. First assumption, because this old lady has been in this thing, she's done it the old way, and she has nothing to offer me. And we are doing it the new way. I, I, I would never ever get tired saying my appreciation for the African Feminist Forum because there is a collection of feminist stories. Our space, our voices, our voice power and soul. I don't know if people here have seen it, but I'll give a particular uh, example of the way I thought of an older feminist who worked with me very closely. She wasn't close to our issue. She was too old fashioned, too old school. Never really sat with her <laughs> to talk about feminism, you know, but she was in the movement. She was working with me, but we never really had that kind of exchange where I got to understand her position. So there were a lot of assumptions about where she came from. And then that book came out. I'm featured, she's featured, and I'm talking about Dr. Skoka Pierre. Auntie Douglas had always come off to be married to a military man as this very hardliner. When I read her story, the first thing that came to my mind, if many young feminists were reading the stories of older women, we wouldn't be trying to get them out of our spaces fast. We would be thinking, how can we maximize the wealth of experience they bring to the table what can we take from it, and how can we cultivate a space for them to retire into? But what we're doing with these older feminists, the tendency for these people to do it to us is very high. Because also we're not sharing, or we're not talking about our issues, let alone a teenage daughter of mine and yours. I feel I should reiterate the point that young African women are not asking for permission to organize or to be African feminists. They are doing it. Um, are they excluding older women from their spaces? I think it's hard for me to tell because I actually am not in those spaces. And the spaces like the AFF, the African Feminist Forum, are multi-generational and they do do a good job of, of bringing multiple voices. How those voices, which voices are dominant and which are not, are based on many factors. And I think there is the age factor, 
but there are others, class, etc., etc. Um, I think Lima's bringing the really important point of codifying memory and making sure that we have a sense of what's happened before. We're not reiterating the same mistakes. We're not doing the same things over and over. But we also have to recognize the changing contexts, that some things we don't have answers to from the past, that people are inventing as we move forward, and those are things that we can learn from. I just want to make a side note around the LGBTI issue. Often, because it's an emerging issue in terms of the ways in which it's being politicized, it's framed as a young issue. And yet, queer Africans have been queer for generations and, and organizing as such. So, I just a caution there that LGBTI issues are not necessarily young issues. Oh, Samir. Yeah, if I can also just jump in and just kind of, um, I think, support what Hakima is saying. Which is that for me, I, I feel like the framing of the discussion so far is, and this is despite Hakima's initial point, is, is about this idea of bringing young women in. Um, and like similarly, the idea of mentoring and the idea of handing, passing on the baton. Um, which I think are all sort of le 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 legitimate ideas in terms of thinking about maybe formal structures that exist or formal organizations where in a very sort of literal and practical sense, at some point somebody new has to take over the organization. But I think at a more kind of conceptual level, I would want to, and I believe this is what Hakim is saying, is to say, well actually let's question that model itself, the notion that it's about older women who have more experience of feminist activism, even though obviously the contexts are always changing, as she said, um, in a sense schooling or educating the younger women. Like I just feel like we shouldn't even be talking about it like that. We should rather just be talking about what are the different issues, um, what are the different spaces in which different women, and differentiated by age as well as by other factors that are operating in, and how do we have dialogue? But the dialogue, dialogue is you know it's both ways. It's not the older, wiser, experienced women uh, educating the younger ones because there's a lot to be learned in all sorts of directions. Um, at the same time, again, but I also agree very much with what Hakima said, and I think this is one of the things AWDF is doing, and Feminist Africa, which is an academic journal, is documenting and chronicling the history, because obviously there is no point in making the same mistakes or reinventing the wheel, but at the same time, young African feminists don't necessarily need some sort of education in such a literal or strict sense. Thank you, Samir. Um, Spectra, what, what role does, does media, particularly digital media, play in the conversation? Um, sorry, I have a lot of thoughts in my head. Um, I think, I want to just quickly um, come back to this idea of, um, that I think there's an assumption, a really light one, but I, it, I, it, I'm perceiving it, so I want to call it out. There's an assumption that, um, that young people don't necessarily that there's tension in the sense that young people don't want older people in their space and older people are trying to hold on to that. That hasn't, I'm sure that does exist, but I don't think that is always necessarily the case. Um, when I was organizing in Boston and trying to create a space for LGBT women of color, um, and I had no idea how to do this, I just needed to do this, and more if I'm being completely honest, for my own survival. Um, as a Nigerian, a uh, woman who's you know, in, a, in, a, in a partnership with another woman, um, queer, lesbian, I don't like labels, but you know, people put them on me anyway. Um, there, it was really, really hard to find support. I always you know, joke, when, when we talk about the impacts of media, I always joke that um, I tweeted once that I was the only gay Nigerian in the world, in a very typical melodramatic fashion um, <laughs> of my generation. And like seven other people retweeted the same thing, and instantly I found community. And so I think, you know, media as, um, for me, has been a white elephant in the room today. We've talked about how, for instance, African feminists used to be, their voices used to be um, overshadowed by other, you know, other voices with more privilege, more access. And then all of a sudden one day, that wasn't the case. And the magic of all of a sudden one day wasn't the case for me, it wasn't magic, but that there was a democratization of which voices you got to hear, um, in part through the advancements of media and technology. 
um, in part through the boom of social media and definitely in part through the bad behavior, rebelliousness of young African feminists just not seeking permission before they were allowed to speak. And so, you know, the, it's really hard for me to tease apart um, the issue of intergenerational activism from um, the impact and the role of media in connecting us and in preserving our stories as well. Um, as a young person who was looking for, for role models, any model um, to which to, <laughs> to learn from and um, capitalize on when I was trying to organize um, and create safe spaces for LGBT women of color in Boston, um, I found nothing. And what happens now, I mean, maybe back in the day, and I remember a time when I used to go to the library to search for information, but now when I hear a word like, you know, global feminism and I don't know what it means, I open my laptop and I Google it. And so, you know, trying to find a model, trying to find other queer Nigerians, trying to find um, other LGBT Africans, other African feminists that were LGBT friendly, trying to find all of those things and not having um, Google search results speak back at me was a key issue. And so for me, I think when we talk about um, nurturing intergenerational activism, solving the problem of not documenting our history and, 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 in, and in so doing, um, provide not necessarily education in the formal speak, but um, offering some different models and ways of, of, of working. Um, in solving that problem, I don't think we can do it without talking about media and the role that it's, it's played in not just archiving history, you know, stuff that has already happened, but in documenting the you know, inventions and the, and the in innovations that are happening now. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. There was a whole lot in my head. <laughs> it does. I respect her. Um, I want to come back to a point that Cindy made earlier, but first, I'm a, if you could just talk a little bit about, um, as, as you um, visualize and help um, the movement in Liberia be born, what was your, I guess, your thinking, or how intentional was your thinking around bringing together women of different generations and classes? First thing first, I put myself at a very difficult place. Women's activism in Liberia had been quote unquote elitist. First, they, were, they had a political name. Um, um, the government at the time, and okay, first let me go back into our history. A lot of the work that the women did were um, based on social services historically. There were very few political activists, and the one who became prominent was President Serbi. In our culture at the time, it was unheard of. So she was giving all kinds of names, you know, for daring to go into that space of activism. And the women who dared to go along with her, we were, which were just about a handful, were also stereotyped a lot. The group who morphed into peace activists were people who had been providing social services and doing other things. And they were called, quote unquote, the eminent women of Liberia. So when we started that movement, it was like, and a lot of the young people on this panel can say, you know, we, it's not a competition. And that was the attitude I went in that mindset, that it's, there's a lot to do, and this is not competition. Anything will step into this space to assist what you do, complement your work. But it was met with fierce resistance native, and it had a lot to do with our culture too, and the history of our country coming from two um, different political and socio-cultural, free slave culture, and all of these different things. So it was a fight. All we were looking for was a group of women that would come together and help us accomplish our purpose, given that this first group that we turned to were not willing, they were predominantly older women to mix with us because they felt like we were taking their space. As we engage, in hindsight, we realize that we did the same thing they did. We never deliberately sought out, uh, sought that out young women to be a part of our movement. So my age group got together, their age group were against us, and you have the younger group standing there watching all of this drama unfold. It was after the fact that we sat down and said we've done great work. 
and we must deliberately open up this space for whatever conversation these young people are having to be a part of our conversation. And once we did that, we realized that until today, I just got back from Monrovia in February, I, I, I go, whoa. You have a lot of feminist ideas and a lot of feminist thinking, a lot of ways you, 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 you think this country with Africa's first female president heralded as the, the, the capital of grassroots activism, and you sit and listen to the young women, and I'm not talking about the young women and the not so young women on this panel. I'm talking about at the grassroots level. Talk about issues of sexuality, how they see themselves, how they are using their voices, and you say, we haven't even started doing the work that we're doing. And I think I will just stop there because there are virgin territories, even in Nigeria, more especially in Liberia, Ghana, places where the covenants of spectra, semi, these young people need. And I think we sometimes get too busy with all of the other things that are happening to stretch our arms into those spaces. So whilst you are not waiting, you are stepping into your space, I think it's important for you as you step into your space to pull one or two other young women along. Let me just come um, to Spectra's points about looking around for a community to support her. One of my scholars, I suspect, is gay. And she's tried to say this to me in so many ways. And I feel so bad because for her, it's difficult to express it in a culture that's so anti. So many times we're in the room with our network of scholars, and she will ask questions, especially when we're talking about bodily integrity, of what if you're attracted to a woman? And everyone will turn and look at her, and then she'll say, just joking. She just came back from a trip. And I was talking to some of the people who mentored her on the trip. And they said she was just so open. So I'm sad that as exposed as I think I am, I've never really seen that to be able to draw. I mean, I saw it, but I think my confession is they didn't want to write the quote amongst those young women to push her further to say. You know, and, and, and coming back from DRC where I engage with some of our mentors, it just makes me feel so bad that we have this situation now. And some of us as labor as we think we are, still find ourselves stuck at a place where we have to think twice to embrace some of the emerging issues. A sideline to your thing. LGBT issues have been in the African feminist or African community for a long time. But this is the first time we've dared to bring it out in public, like condemning FGM. And that's where I come to say we've made great gains, but we still have a lot more to do. So, this is a very difficult conversation to have for me. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ellis, I, I do want to come back to you, Simi, and I'm sure that there were questions from the audience. Um, one of the questions I want to ask you, Simi, you, you, you and Spectrum have all talked about the fact that young women and the younger generation are, they're, they're creating their own spaces, they're, 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 they're becoming activists with their wealth without a formal endorsement from, from their elders. And I was hoping you could just talk about, this, aside from the academic spaces, you know, which we have, have identified as being sometimes the latest, um, where are the spaces that you were seeing younger women activists um, 
coming together, building community, doing work? I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, and I was saying earlier to Hakima and um, Spectra that um, I guess personally I don't necessarily feel that I'm in those spaces or that I know of them beyond a very sort of superficial sense. So for instance, like Spectra was mentioning, um, I think there is quite a lot of online activism, I suppose, and online community building amongst young African feminists, um, which I think is very interesting and you know creates a lot of interesting kind of discussion and opportunities, but I also think it can be problematic in some ways. So I would, you know, I wouldn't sort of just kind of uncritically say that it's there and that's a great, it is a good thing, but in some ways I think it's also, it is also quite elitist in some ways in terms of thinking about who has access to those spaces. And as a young and very privileged African woman myself, I do have access to those spaces, but I still actually find them quite exclusionary. So I'm just kind of putting that out there. Um, otherwise, I, as I said, I'm not, I don't feel that I'm qualified to really talk about what young African women are doing in a very concrete sense, but I guess for me it was just more about making a, a point about, again, as I said, the idea that people will do things regardless of some kind of formal, uh, as you said, endorsement or, you know, induction to feminism, African feminism, through some kind of um, forum where the older women are kind of holding your hand. I mean, I just don't think that's the case. People don't need that. Um, that's the point that I was trying to make. Um, Spectra, can you mind? Do we have a question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I do see um, a number of spaces. I want to also point out that I think sometimes when we talk about activism or feminism, um, it tends to take on a very similar monochrome shade. Um, it's policy, it's protesting, it's writing eloquent blogs and journals and things like that. But there's also quite a lot of um, powerful work and I think really impactful work happening in music and in art. Yeah. And, um, just in different arenas, which we just need to better recognize, quite honestly. Um, Beyonce, for better or worse, you can find her product, I'm throwing her out there, I am. Um, you can find her problematic, you can find her, but th she's starting conversations. Um, Ineka, a Nigerian artist who I, I love, is, is, you know, I mean, it's not often I meet, or, you know, it, it's not every day that it happens that you have a Nigerian musician who's writing about, you know, oil spillage in the middle of Nigeria. It's, it's such a, it's an odd but absolutely sexy pairing, and I, I would love to see um, more of that kind of work recognized, um, because you do find a lot more young people in those spaces as well, probably because with art and, and, um, and creative activism, there's more room for freedom of, um, there's more freedom of personal expression, um, and the rules are not so black and white, they're a little bit uh, grayer than they are in you know, more formal spaces where get to just talk at you and just, you know, you listen. Um, so I think there, there, are, there are many different forms. I would say music, the arts definitely, um, theater. There's just, there's just way more avenues that um, are creating really powerful um, conversations and ripple effects among, you know, regarding raising consciousness, especially, I mean, and I can speak as an LGBT person who's African. Um, I'm really encouraged by the number of documentaries that have emerged in the past five years that are putting actual real faces to people live in the country because I mean quite honestly in Nigeria I'm pretty sure at least 80% of the people I know um, I'm like their one gay friend and you know I'm the one I'm the one person that they see because it is very unsafe of an environment and people are heavily persecuted and etc etc um, so I'm the I'm I'm the it has so much responsibility so I would I would like to see more so I would like to see more of the kind of activism that comes out from the arts and the music um, that is making it so that I don't have to be the only human face and my expression and my story is not the only story. Um, I'd like to see more of that recognized and affirmed, um, especially by, by, by older feminists, because again, I think perhaps because it was a different context, you know, uh, what, what Jimmy mentioned with the, you know, going through academia, getting the, the credentials, um, publishing journals, speaking, conferences, etc. There's a certain kind of activism and a certain kind of conversation and discourse that happens in these spaces. Um, but there are some really transformational ones happening outside of it. Jimmy, can I just jump in? Well, well we go to Kima first. So, so, sorry, I, I just want to jump onto Spectra and, and say to her, as, 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 I like as, 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 as I'm 
trying to speak with the voice of some of the older feminists. And it's a two-way learning history. Just as you try to understand, your generation try to understand the work that has been done, or the social spaces of the opposition that these older and not so old feminists had to do, or it's, I think it's about younger people also trying to explain and, 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 and mentor or school them, I don't want to use that word, educate or school, but it's, it's trying to bring them to understand. Trust me, at AFF, when some of those dances were going on and those old ladies were grabbing their bags and saying, I'm going to bed, you know, you, if you sit with some of those, even with some of the songs that we have in popular culture, I am a mother of a 21 year old, 20 year old, 18 to 16 year old, and a four going on 40. And <laughs> my boys used to do things with Fittison and, 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 and um, what's his name, Kanye West. And there was all this bet going on and nonsense about who's the best in the world and things like that. I sat up one night as if I didn't have work to do to watch the American Music Award with them, Africa time. So you know everyone is supposed to be sleeping at that time. And then in the morning, said, let's have a conversation about Ferguson. But my knowledge of him was standing in a Barnes and Noble store not wanting to buy his book and reading quick, 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 and absorbing what I could absorb about his life and doing the same thing on the internet about Kanye West and raising myself for that conversation. When they, by the time we started having that conversation, I, they felt like I was a cool mom, even though I had an agenda. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, my agenda won anyway, but they made me to understand certain things. My son is into art and popular culture. He has his own website, sells his stuff, came to the U.S. and said he wanted to be an architect and after one semester, he's an artist. What do I do? But I go back on his site and because he has his goods that he sells and he promotes African musicians in the diaspora also on his website. And I see some of the images that are so offensive to me as a feminist. And I don't shout, but I try to have a conversation about what do you want to represent. But if he wasn't inviting me into his world, and that's the point I'm trying to make, it would be difficult. So we're not as old as you think we are. <laughs> The first lady here can dance you off this floor. Don't ever try BC. <laughs> I can keep it down there for a while. <laughs> but I also have some like NECA and all of the different things. But until if you people make us to understand how important this is in your space, we will be able to be advocates for some of those things. But it's very, I know you want to jump right back on me because I see you, I see you coming. Bring it on, girl, bring it on. That's the kind of thing I like to see. Bring it on, baby. <laughs> but, I mean, just coming back to your point, you respect the arts, the culture, and because some of the students, they're saying boogie, all of the different things. But you have to make us understand. And until we have that understanding, we will always talk about protests and different things and that other thing. And, and, and like I always talk with the older Liberian women, this is not competition, it's cooperation because we're all fighting to get to the same goal, I think. Um, Akima, I'm going to just respond and come back to Spectrum. I'm not sure that I'm responding, but that I'm maybe adding something to this. I think I'm going to permit myself to guess your age, Lima. But I think you and I come from this uh, a strange generation that's somewhere sitting in, in the middle of something. Because my historic reference points that I can quote Amakal Cabral just like that, but I can't use Viber. 
and not, a lot of my generation can't quote <laughs> I don't even know what it is really, but my kid has it on her phone. Um, I, we came of age at the time of structural adjustment and all of the issues, those kinds of struggles in Africa. Um, and I feel that we're watching another generation come of age at an entirely different time, but a really important one, where people are attempting to define Africanness at the exclusion and disappearance of women, at the exclusion and disappearance of LGBTQ folk, at the exclusion and disappearance of a progressive narrative on Africa. And we're seeing protest movements of resistance against that in the African feminist movement, in North Africa, in all over the continent. I think when I was saying about the LGBT issue, we have to be careful about framing it as, as this new issue. Because I have a, had a conversation with a friend of mine's grandmother from Zimbabwe. She's in her 80s. We were talking about how Robert Mugabe and his big homophobia, and she was saying, ah, but those things have been here. She, I don't care about those things. Those are not, that's not something that she felt was an issue or something that is problematic. And we can't make the presumption that the flip is true, that young Africans are not actually deeply or vehemently homophobic or heterosexist or misogynist or whatever it is. There, there are ways in which, as I said, the, culture, the contextual shifts that have happened in Africa, we have to remember how to analyze those to understand what's happening. The, the ways in which the evangelist church has penetrated and used uh, misogynist <laughs> that's new. We didn't have that 20, 30 years ago. So the ways in which we're going to challenge that is going to be new. And young feminists are doing that through culture, through other means, with technologies, even with older technologies like radio and things like that, which I think have wider reach. Um, one point before I stop, just to recognize Sally Tiam is in the audience. And she is the director of an organization called Non on Record, which actually archives LGBTIQ African stories and individual stories. And I think that's an important platform. Welcome, thank you. <laughs> yeah, just really quickly, Lima. <laughs> <laughs> assumption that, you know, when a young, and I just have to put it out there, I'm not even that young, <laughs> when a younger, you know, feminist speaks and talks about intergenerational activism, that, that you know, my, my place of frustration is, is um, that it stems from, you know, this, this idea that, you know, older women are infringing upon my space or trying to tell me what to do, and quite honestly, that's really not where it comes from. For me, you know, when we talk about intergenerational activism or just talk about working together in general across different lines, not just age, but gender, sexuality, etc., um, we can't, I think it's dangerous to minimize it to just a two-way conversation, and here's why. Because if this were a conversation, for example, about race, and a white person was telling me that, well, you know, people of color, you have to try harder, you have to explain, you have to, we, they'd, they'd be annihilated up here because there's a power, no, it's true, because there's a power dynamic with, you know, that, that comes with um, having, you know, a certain kind of privilege. And in this, in this conversation, having extra years, you know, awards you sort of extra authority, um, people, I have to, I'm dressed just how I feel like today, but when I'm usually, you know, on panels and stuff, I have to wear my glasses, I have to, you know, sit up straight and stuff. Or people don't take me seriously, um, because it's like this young, radical, you know, one of her generation. And so there's a burden that comes with being a young person in this space because you're not only tasked with you know just getting on with the work, which is you know doing what you need to do to make the world a better place, but then you're also tasked with having to explain and justify your position and often justify why you're there and why you're doing it differently. And so whereas I do I do completely co-sign that it, that conversations are important and that you know they're even more effective when they happen from a place of empathy both ways. 
I think it's really, really important for older, older feminists, not old feminists, older feminists, because it's relative, it's, it's always going to be, a 16 year old could be saying the same thing about me. Um, but I think it's important that you know, older feminists then acknowledge that they hold more resources in many ways, they, hold more, they have more access in many ways, and so, in a sense, you know, I think somebody said earlier in the panel, like, some people just have no choice. I created a space because I had no choice, because I tried sort of, not penetrating, but I tried being part of spaces that were already in existence, and, you know, sharing my views, or, you know, trying to, you know, let's do this this way, and was very, very often shut down, um, very told often that I didn't know what I was doing, that I've been doing this for 40 years, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm of a particular generation as well. That, you know, I, my college was one of the first colleges to get Facebook. So that skill I recognize as a privilege that I have, that I've become a really good practitioner in, in digital media, probably because I, I got access to it a lot faster than a lot of people. And also because you know, the older feminists in my network just didn't have access to it, didn't know how to use it. So whereas I was able to create a grassroots movement um, in, in Boston that united so many women of color when people told me they did not exist. There were no LGBT women of color in Boston. And this is what older feminists of color told me. Okay, so this, being able to create a movement, yes. <laughs> being able to create a movement using just Facebook or Twitter and getting people to connect in ways that traditional methods have failed. Like people have been funded to um, provide health services for this group which they could not identify or access. And yet here was this young person who was using Facebook and had you know 3,000 people on there and could you know put together a conference with 400 people attending. They could pass out condoms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's, there's there's learning both ways, but I do I had to take that route because I was not welcomed or affirmed in the other spaces that I that I that I was in. So I think that's really really important to acknowledge alongside acknowledging that we need to have more empathic conversations. I wasn't jumping at you. <laughs> There's a couple more questions, we'll, we'll, we'll open up a couple more questions. Um, this is really for, for Simi and, and to Akima. Um, and we've been talking a lot about how, you know, this, these dichotomies, these separations of, by, by age experience, uh, African women activist, feminist, um, and that this is not anything new. This has existed uh, for some time now. I, I guess what I want to really ask is, what, what the state, by, by, not, by not having traditional dialogue, but by you know by young people not engaging with their older peers or older, older, their elders, by the elders not reaching back um, and being open to take the time to learn about the space that young people are coming together in. I mean, what's what's the state? Why is this necessary to happen? Because it seems at this point that you know you know you've you've, you've had you know the generations have been divided for a long time. So like why why now like why is it necessary now for there to be, to be dialogue and cooperation as that one says? Um, I mean I, I think we've sort of said uh, to an extent I mean one thing that's at stake is that obviously um, like, there's a sense in which I mean I think if you're a young woman and you're sort of engaging a feminist activism of some sort there are all kinds of challenges and if other people have already experienced those challenges and have um, insights to share, there's a sense in which why would you not want to benefit from that knowledge? Which again can be done in a democratic sort of way. So again, it's not, an, it's not about somebody saying this is how it should be done, or this is how you should do it, but it's about dialogue. Um, another thing is that I, I guess I feel that arguably we, maybe not so much in Africa, but there's a certain sort of dialogue about post-feminism in the West which I think is also in Africa in certain ways. Um, so there's a sense in which I think looking at what has gone before, it helps you to also kind of understand and analyze what is in the present. Um, and to sort of see the lines of continuity, even when they are being disguised or when you know, you're know you being told that there are certain things that are over for, in terms of women's struggles, particularly for privilege, for women who are privileged by class and education. Um, also, yeah, and I mean, along the same lines, it's also just the intractability of the challenges that women face, which I think as a, as a young woman or young feminist, there's a lot to sort of learn from seeing what other people have done and the challenges that they've faced. Um, and it's about the continuity and the survival of the movement, I suppose. 
I feel as though it hasn't really been my experience that there has been that division. I've been lucky enough to mostly be in spaces where um, both older and younger feminists have been generous enough with their knowledges to support my growth and activism. So I don't feel it so, although I recognize the power dynamics that are involved throughout our organizing. I think one of the things that I find interesting, and I see this particularly in my family, because we talked about the home as being one of the places in which feminism is passed down, is a reticence, and certainly from, say, my mother to me. My mother was certain that she didn't want me doing this work. She'd been doing it forever, didn't really go anywhere. Why do you have to also struggle? And I see it too, as my child gets older, where I wouldn't it be nice if she could just be normal? Unfortunately, <laughs> I've opened the door to the matrix, and so she sees the world through the same lens that I do, which invariably will mean that she will struggle, and that she will find herself in opposition to the dominant narrative. And that however she chooses that resistance, that will occur from her very being. But I do find that there, there are ways at least in the family, where we almost have a reticence to pass it down because we don't want our children to have to struggle so much. Um, I, and, but in the movement, I don't find that. In the movement, I do find open and practical spaces for older women and younger women to support one another. Um, I would say what movement? <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, because I think, you know, it's, it's really, it's not going to say it's easy, but there's a longing to speak about fem feminism and our movement in this one unified, just bowl of kumbaya. It really is, it's just, it's so, you just want to do it, but when you think about it, we have, you, we have many pockets, right? So, which is why your experience is different from it's just different from mine. Um, which is why I think, you know, coming back to this idea of, of media and documentation and passing our stories is so important because across movements, across different pockets of organizing, we can learn from each other. Um, when I think about what's at stake, I think about my own personal story. So I attempted suicide when I was 18 years old. And it's because um, being, you know, queer and Nigerian and thinking that I really, again, in my emo, very dramatic, um, moment, thinking that I was the only queer Nigerian in the entire world and that there was no space for me. Um, I didn't, I just didn't want to be here anymore. And, and the moment before I decided that I didn't want to be anymore, I googled queer Nigeria, which is the worst thing I could have done. Um, because the media out there and the information out there was written by a bunch of homegirls. And so I saw a whole lot about me going to hell, I should die, it's an African, etc., etc., etc. And now, if you, if you look up um, LGBT Africa, you find a lot more stories and more that are, I mean, it's still pretty bad, <laughs> but Nicholas Kristoff and all, but you, you still find um, stories of uprising, stories of survival, stories of resistance. You find my story, you find other people's stories, and I think what keeps me going is that I don't want anyone to ever Google LGBT Nigeria and not find something that gives them hope to keep going. And secondly, given that I'm an, you know, an activist who's been able to um, amplify my story and um, teach other people to amplify their story using media, technology, etc. I would want somebody who would like to be part of that work or to continue that work to be able to learn from what I've done and not repeat my mistakes and um, or tell me what I could be doing better because I'm still doing it. And so there is a lot at stake when we don't when we don't speak to each other across generations because we don't archive our work. We make it really hard for us to learn from each other, um, not just intergenerationally but across movements and across. Um, pockets of organizing, so um, there's a lot at stake, and in my in my particular um, from my particular context, people's lives. I'm going to take take it back to I'm going to close out that part of this question and open up the audience. I'm, I'm going to jump in and say something, as a rebel, because okay. yeah, you're a man of enough wisdom. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> brings up a really important point that I don't think we've raised, and that's around accountability within the movement. 
I think that's a, a question that's, that's actually one of the most important ones in the sense that whatever the generation, we find it hard to hear the critique. Mm -hmm. Whatever the generation, the younger people feel they're doing it best, older people feel they're doing it best, us in the middle feel we're doing it best. And we have a hard time knowing how to say to each other, mm -hmm. I feel that's not right. You bring in the power dynamic of, of one being older, of different classes, of ethnicity, of whatever it is, and there's added dimension to that. But we do have to learn to be able to speak a language that enables us to be accountable to one another. And I think that's really important. Thank you, you raise a very good point, and I think <laughs> there's a lot of perception. You know, um, people perceive the other as um, thinking, oh, you have the power. So before we even begin to engage, you've already strengthened your position of defense. And you see it a lot. I did it to the older women. And today, when Spectra sees me, and as soon as I open my mouth, she's thinking, strength, power, I'm young. I'm just using you as an example because I like to pick on the young people. <laughs> strength, power, and maybe she's about to. And sometimes, I think this morning on the first panel, there was a lot of conversation about listening as an action thing. And I think we don't do a lot of that amongst ourselves across generations, we, we, when someone speaks, before it even comes out of their mouth, we've already done our mental analysis and, 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 and have broken it down to, and, and have heard it as this. And so we, we're just moving to that. And I think if we begin to listen to each other and speak with, each other instead of at each other, we will get to. Because in Nairobi, when that old feminist was talking about her experiences, and as she sits here and talk about the challenges and the difficulties, I was smiling the entire time because girlfriend, we go through the same thing. You 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 it's 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 sometimes you get to that place and I reading BC's book and, and you, you, you read into the frustration and the loneliness. So it's just not about a particular orientation. It's just about that position that you've taken as a feminist on a continent that, so you, you, sometimes you're just isolated and you sit there and you scratch your head and you wonder, and do you want to know the other part of it let success or an accolade add to that notion of power or that name that you bear. You become isolated even further. And I think a lot of people in this room, a lot of the women who've been in the space and have been successful in their spaces will tell you the different frustration that they go through. Where we need to come, and I don't like, I don't like to talk about it, because this is my frustration, and I've conditioned myself not to cry. That's all right, but that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I've conditioned myself not to cry, because I think I will be crying many days, because it will take a long time to change. Mm -hmm. But, and I'm taking this way off, so I think I'll just stop. <laughs> but I think the most important thing is, how do we begin to see each other with the, the, the little power that all of us have, and how do we begin to see it as for the benefit of each other and not to bring the other down? I tell people the, 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 the best thing that happened to me was winning the Nobel Peace Prize. But the worst thing that happened to me also was winning the Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you. Hello, my name is Women I am the Native American Communities Foundation in Liberia. Um, two questions real quick. How do 
the way it effectively gets the story so hard. When we spoke about the old people who are not conditioned and maybe not educated, to get the story so but I think it's very, very important at some point in the movement, even to get people to sit with them. And then again, that's another way to bring the younger generation with the older generation, and that's the much older generation, to be able to get the actual stories told. And my second question is, um, we've been talking, there's been a lot of talk from this morning to this afternoon about um, issues of inclusion. How do we address issues of inclusion generally? So that's class, culture, societal perceptions, like the points raised this morning by the men, um, issues of elitism, like West Point versus Mama Point and Fuller. And that's what I hear for a year, it would be like living Hollywood versus living in maybe South Bronx. Um, Silent thing has been mentioned by Spectra, as, and I'm talking about the younger people and older people. Um, in Africa, for sure, I know there's something not necessarily in Liberia, even though know, if you go more to the traditional um, counties, it happens. But in other countries like Nigeria and Ghana, there's a lot of things that have to do with class. And you know, if you're older and how you're supposed to interact with the older generation. Um, so how? I mean, there's a tendency, like um, I think some of you already mentioned, of the young people that ask for permission to speak right now. But there's also the tendency that older people feel that they need to be respected and they need to be honored and acknowledged and their titles and all of that. So in this movement, how is this being, how can we fit and fix those issues? We are in this space because it's a space of possibility. Okay. All of us, old, middle-aged, young, on the departure the end of life or just born or whatever, have worked a long time to do a number of things in our movements. And one of the key things has been to break down notions of division, particularly those based on binaries. Old, young rich, poor, city, country. Because one of the things that is absolutely key is that none of us are only one or other of those things at any given moment. And yes, a lot of us here speak from the place of privilege, for example, because we are highly educated even if we did grow up in the biggest slums in our, on the continent. However, that education does not necessarily ipso facto separate us entirely from where we were born. Many of us are in this room because we're trying to keep that space of integrity that we learned where we were born. And so, Yes, I am not the old woman in the desert who has had life experience that I haven't shared. I'm also not the young gay woman in the high-rise in Cape Town who has had a life experience also that I haven't shared. But from where I stand as a middle-class Ghanaian woman, what I do have is the fact that I have spoken to both people. And from that ability to listen to both can help them make connections, all of us, with each other and understand what it is we have in common. Please, let's not forget that. Because otherwise, we are really going to repeat the very things that we are trying to fight and none of us have exclusive knowledge. So let's not forget what we have learned along the way and why we're doing what we need to do. And also, technologies change societies. They really do. You know, and that's across everywhere. Beethoven could not have written what he wrote if the, if the piano forte had not been invented. And yes, our mothers did not 
change, could not change certain things because in fact they could not tweet. And the fact that today you can tweet and in an instant meet, reach hundreds of thousands of people does change where you are standing. But that does not invalidate the fact that the person who could only communicate by walking a piece down the road or writing a letter did not have something to teach us. So let's also not forget that, that every new instrument is as good or as powerful or as dangerous as our ability to use it for an ethical reason. I would like to challenge you all not only to speak to your children and your mothers, but to speak to your grandmothers um, as someone of, her, of, of their age, uh, and maybe great-grandmothers, because these women made the African revolutions against colonialism, and they have a, a whole lot to say about what it means to try to transform a society. There was a little discussion this morning about transformation as opposed to just personal uh, change or just a movement in your country, but something that really fundamentally changes society. And that's what happened during the African revolutions. They not only made change the map of Africa, but they changed the very concept of what a revolution was about because it was grassroots, it was workers and peasants, it was people saying, uh, we can uh, govern ourselves and we can create a different society. Uh, you all mentioned Fanon and Cabral in passing, but I think uh, we can't let them be passed and, and our grandmothers and great-grandmothers be passed. We have to work for that kind of a total transformation because, let's face it, there's been a huge counter-revolution throughout the world, as Jimmy mentioned in terms of the civil rights movement, which was my background, uh, very much tied to the African Revolution through the exchange of ideas. And now there's been a huge counter-revolution against that. There's also an economic crisis, which we have to deal with in real terms, and, and not just uh, blame it on politics, and not just say neoliberalism, which doesn't just a political category. Um, there are huge challenges out there if we're going to make better lives for men and women, uh, and if women are ever going to be able to be free to develop who they are and all their creativity. So I just think we need some of that discussion and not to act just as if there's some kind of linear progress and we can learn something from the older people. But really, we have to make a second African revolution or third. <laughs> because, you know, they fell, fell into terrible, uh, but most of them into terrible counter revolutions. We can see this in South Africa today. You don't have to go back three generations, yeah. right? I'm, I'm sorry, man. Um, I need to, we don't want to go back to the first two questions that Sister Purple you asked, and then get the opportunity for younger, younger African women to answer. But let's go to those first two questions first. Get those addressed before any more questions. We'll come back to you. It's not a question, it's a very short comment, okay. and I'm going to do okay. my best to be articulate. I think what is missing from this conversation right now is an understanding that intergenerational solidarity, organizing intergenerational feminism is about relationship building. And I think I haven't really heard that. It's about the fact that here I am as a young African feminist, as a Nigerian woman living in the Caribbean, living across multiple intersections, that I've been able to be here because I, for example, have had conversations with you know, 80 year old women that were at the CSW 15, however many years ago, advocating for the same things that I'm standing here doing, or the fact that publications such as Feminist Africa exist, or that you know, I'm able to communicate with people like Hakima and Spectra and Zimi using social media, but it's about building relationships. And so it's not about, you know, you know, those over there are the old feminists, or we over here are the young feminists, it's about what we can learn from each other. Um, and something else that I heard, or very lightly, that I wanted to touch on is this idea of feminism is a politic. Feminism isn't a profession, so it's not just something that we can get off the bus when we feel like. Once, it doesn't matter if we're 20, year old, 20 years old or 80 years old, these issues still exist. And as long as we have the relationships and as long as we tie ourselves and, and form alliances with each other, 
we're stronger and better able to address these issues. So I feel like there's been a little bit of a disconnect for me on this issue of age because there's so much that we've been able to do because of relationships. I founded something called Frida, I was part of a, a group that founded something called Frida, the Young Feminist Fund, and we were only able to do that from the experiences we learned from people like Bithi and the African Women's Development Fund. From asking, sitting down and having conversations, what did you do, how did you do it, how can we do it better, what can we learn? And so this whole question about intergenerational solidarity, organizing, I have to say, we miss the mark if we don't see it as relationship building for us at Formal. Thank you. Um, the first, the first two questions I would ask before, how do you think we get stories told? Um, or to take that question? I think we started, like I said, with the AFM, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done on the continent. I was at the White House last Wednesday, sitting with the National Security Council, people on there. President Obama is about to bring all of our presidents from Africa here in August for the famous or infamous Africa Summit. And they're trying to set their agenda. And coming back from DRC, coming back from Nairobi, working with Southern Sudanese women, the conversation around women at the peace table came up. And how do we sit with that? in that conversation at the Africa Summit. And someone who is the, one of the experts in that meeting says, we can't find a qualified African woman to sit at the table. And I just told, told myself in my head, they're about to bounce me out of this meeting. <laughs> I turned to her and said, where have you been looking? Because like I said this morning, when people go on the continent to look for stories, they are looking for stories of misery. When they go to look for women, they're looking for miserable women. When they go to look for People who can speak, they're looking for women who can speak the language that they want to hear. So until we start documenting the stories of strength, from our perspective, like I said in DRC, we're sitting around the table and these women are telling their stories and the only questions that were coming from the others. So how many times were you raped? Did you not hear her say a community of women came to a rescue? Don't we want to capitalize on that particular aspect of the story and say when they came, what did they do? What did they bring? How did they get the resources? How were they able to help you live through your trauma? And when you've got the strength, what are you doing with the strength? Well, how many times were you raped? Did they insert an object in you? Did they do this? Did they do that? Did they do the other? Because those are the things that people want to bring back here and continue to portray us as weak with sagging breasts and some of us have it very good. <laughs> and begging war and all kinds of things. But this whole aspect of writing and telling our stories it's so important, Auntie Abina and Cole did. I don't know how many of you have dealt with writing in Africa. But when you read some of those stories, it is stories that you will even start thinking about, like on the men's panel, people in the village don't know anything about feminism. Women writing in Africa tells you where feminism started from. And so I, I think it's important that we seek out women who have done great work in our communities because if we don't do it, no one will. Help them document their stories because as you see us like this and like this, if we don't put it on paper, no one would have known that my trauma 
in my life is just going to Macy's or TJ Maxx to just buy underwear. That's my trauma. I always buy, I just buy and buy. Because at one point in time in my life, I had only two. If I had that rating my book, young people will not know that this woman came from here to here. Or that this story happened from here to here. We need to deliberately start writing stories of our mothers and our grandmothers and our aunties and those women in the communities who have done great work. And we, we should not wait for donors funding. That's the um, There was also a question about inclusion generally across race, class, geography. How do we um, address both the best issues of inclusion of the rocks those are the lines? This is totally going to be a kumbaya answer. I'm sorry in advance. Um, I think earlier in my bio, which is really long, part of what I, 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 I try to, the lens I use when I write and when I create media is um, compassion and love. And it might sound very you know, gimmicky and you know, whatever, but ultimately, and I think it echoes what Lima has been saying on, on this panel as well, is that there's just like, the world is a mess and we can try to, to make it better, we can build a movement, we can you know, check ourselves, we can you know, find ways to create you know, collective accountability, all of that stuff. Um, it doesn't do as much in my, in my personal experience. It doesn't, it's not as effective as if um, you learn to listen and you learn to empathize and you put yourself in, in you try to, to imagine what someone else's pain or frustration could be like before you then express yours. And so, you know, for me, and it's, it's, and it's something, it's not an easy practice because we're human, we get frustrated, we, you know, we advocate for our position. A lot of us in many ways are, um, under attack or experiencing oppression in, in, in very, very um, potent ways. So it's, it's, just, it's just our nature to sort of defend ourselves a lot of the time. What I have found, um, and I think what I've witnessed as really transformative in the spaces that I have been fortunate to be a part of and some that I've been able to create, is to create a, a you know, to, to, to get into the habit of facilitating conversations, being part of them, leading them, um, where you learn to put your pain on the back burner and listen to what someone else is saying. Um, before you speak, and for me, that has you know resulted in you know yelling, but then hugs, crying, and then hugs, and that for me is what this is all about. If we're not building, well, just to, to figure out what Amina said, if we're not building a movement that's based on um, relationships, really, that's what we're trying to fight for, like people being able to be in relationships um, from an equitable place, and so that to, to sort of subvert some of the power dynamics that have made it. Um, so that the world is unjust and unfair. If we're not building a movement that is based on relationships and empathy and compassion, then I really don't know what we're doing. Jimmy, can I just jump in on that? <laughs> please, please, I know we have to go, but let's, let's bring it down to our community. And I think when Piso talked about inclusion, it's easy for, and, and, and some people mention, those who have been exposed, and we are all speaking from a position of privilege. Let's not forget that. We're able to set our own agendas. We're able to cultivate our own spaces. But there are communities where you have young women that you have to deliberately attempt to include in this conversation. And those are those places in, at the grassroots level. And you know, I don't want us to we can build relationship, darling, but on the continent, there will always be an Auntie Abena and a layman, regardless of where she's come. There will always be, even if you have that relationship, you can never really have that equal relationship in the feminist movement in Africa. Because there is the recognition that I cannot walk into the room based on my socialization, regardless of how empowered I think I am, and call her Abina. Right. It's just not it. Yeah. We can talk about the issues at an equal level, but there will still be a recognition of that power dynamics. What takes me, a Nobel laureate, out of my bed when a PC at the lay fire me sent for me and say, come to Ikechi? It is that power thing that there will always be mentors and mentees. 
Let's not forget that. I have to say that. There will always be see a professor Amina Mama at a conference or at a dinner in California and going to her and saying, you know, but when it comes to having that conversation about the issues, you will have that space. But they will always see you, Mama, if I see you as you, Spectra, as open and empowered as you are. And I said, sweetheart, please carry my bag. You won't say no. <laughs> And I'm sure uh, people like Simi and uh, 
manufacturer will know the cases I'm talking about. This is IKG Club, Bella Niger, a Facebook network, a Facebook group called Base, and so on, and we find them in church. Now, we know the amount of money that these churches bring, especially the Pentecostals, mm -hmm. with their pastors uh, you know, owning private jets and so on. Who are the people who are donating money in these churches? Yeah. For the churches to become so wealthy. So how come you are not using your power to do that? Great, but you need to not only do it yourself, you need to, we need you to, I'm just using this as an example, you need to get out there and get more young women to fund the feminist movement. We have not had an African feminist forum in three years because we are not sure about where we can get the money from. And the understanding was that after being donor funded for the first three cycles, as in the first six years, because it happens every other year, we will get to a point where it can be self-financing. So now it's been a dream. We have a lot of young women in the private sector. A lot of them work in banks and telecommunications and so on. And in many cities in Africa today, that's where the big money is. How can we leverage that influence? And last but not least, as uh, I used to be a young feminist, and then I became a youngish feminist, and now, since I turned 50 last day, I'm probably going to be classified as just an old feminist anyway. Being young, being young, therefore, is not an identity that is fixed. It is not permanent. So all these conversations we are having, at the end of the day, I happen to agree with my sister here, they're all about relationships and how we can leverage on them. Having said that, as an older feminist who worked very hard to dismantle the um, indecent dressing bill that um, the National Assembly tried to pass in Nigeria, both directly and indirectly, we fought that bill to a standstill and it was dropped. So yes, you know, we, you know, from where we, from where I stand, women's bodily integrity is, you know, for me it's, you know, it's non-negotiable. Having said that, how come a lot of young women these days can't keep their clothes on? Really? I love Beyonce. And I like the fact that, you know, she's helped, you know, elevate the conversation in some circles where the word, the F word, will probably never be heard and so on. But what message are we sending out to the majority of young women out there who think that it's cool to walk around in certain ways? Just, just a question. So essentially what I'm saying is we all owe ourselves responsibility to have a conversation about the core values of the feminist movement. We have an African feminist charter which is the first of its kind in the world, and even our feminist sisters in Latin America and South Asian countries have uh, learned from this document and adapted it to their own environment. I'm going to stop soon. I came all the way from Nigeria, so I'm not. So you need to give me another two minutes. Uh, another one minute. So we have this African feminist, uh, the African feminist charter. Can you please, again, using the path of language that you have on the rest of the world's path here, can we try and popularize this way beyond our own circle so that a lot of people out there can be part of the conversation? Because it's, extreme, it's extremely important. Thank you. Can I? Can I? Yeah. I'm a little hey, busy, you're showing your age, yeah. telling the young girls to get dressed. <laughs>
And I, I want to tie it into what Bima was saying about well-being, because I think there is something intergenerational about how we look after one another. This work is, especially if we're using an anti-capitalist frame, is never going to make us wealthy or leave us in a good space. And our retirement plans are, I, I, I'm going to use an example. Recently, just a few weeks ago, an activist in South Africa called Sally Gross, who's an intersex activist, was sick for, for a long time and needed support. And there was just no way of getting that support from other activists because there weren't funds, etc. Sally died alone and in need of healthcare. That happens a lot, it's just one story. It happens throughout the continent, especially around grassroots activists, especially people who have given themselves in service to our movements, liberation movements and current movements, people dying, because they can't access healthcare, et cetera, and we don't have mechanisms to support them, and we need those mechanisms, and we need to develop them outside of a capitalist frame. We need to be able to resist capitalism and still be able to support one another. How do we do that? I don't know yet, but... <laughs>